do also note that when the session ends, you will be directed to, an, to access an evaluation form after you have exited the webinar. Once the form is submitted, you will be able to download the speaker's presentation materials via the website as shown. Without further ado, to start us on our journey today, I would now like to invite Mr. Hia Sun Po, Assistant Chief Executive Officer of JTC Corporation to deliver the opening address. Mr. Hia, please. Our industry partners, fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you for joining us at the Build SG Leadership Forum 2020. This forum began in 2018 to provide Build Environment leaders like yourself a platform to share insights, challenges or potential solutions that can push forth the industry. This year has been a challenging year for all of us and I thank you for making time to join us virtually. However, amidst the black COVID-19 cloud, a silver lining has emerged amongst businesses with opportunities to digitalize and adopt new processes, technologies to improve productivity to be able to survive the new norm. More importantly, the COVID-19 situation has also highlighted the importance of sustainability in the design, construction and maintenance of our buildings. While the virus could be treated with vaccines, climate change is almost irreversible and poses an existential threat to our planet. In Singapore, buildings account for over 20% of carbon emissions. Therefore, green buildings are key to Singapore's efforts to develop sustainably and meet our international commitments to address climate change. Together with SGBC and BCA, JTC is currently working with various stakeholders in the private and people sectors and other public agencies to develop the next Singapore Green Building Master Plan. Almost 75% of a building's carbon emission originates from its operations. Energy efficient buildings, therefore, not only make sense for developers and building owners from a maintenance and energy cost perspective, but also help Singapore reduce our carbon emissions. For example, JTC space at Tuas Biomedical Park was awarded the Green Mark Super Low Energy Building this year. Housing the biomedical sector, we employ passive design strategies such as natural ventilation, daylight and large greenery to ensure occupants' comfort by maximizing airflow and mitigating heat. We are pushing boundaries in building performance towards the development of super low energy buildings. This will be a key focus in the next lab of green building transformation. With our extensive portfolio in the industrial space, JTC plays a key role in creating sustainable buildings and estates island-wide. We are pressing on with our sustainability drive for the entire value chain right from the master planning and design to construction to facility management. All this with the aim to create truly sustainable estates and new value for our customers. For example, we are designing circular economies at the master planning stage in our new estate to better optimize the flow of energy, water and waste at a district level. Many of you may also know of JTC's innovation calls and partnership with the industry and academia to develop and test with sustainable construction solutions. In the areas of facilities management, we are also piloting digital technologies and sensors to monitor water and electricity consumption. At the recent Singapore International Energy Week 2020, many of you may have recalled that Minister Chan Chun Singh shared that we will be working towards achieving 1.5 gigawatt peak of solar deployment by 2025, bringing forward the 2030 timeline announced last year. The use of renewable energy is also one of our four main areas of cost-effective features to adopt towards achieving SLEB status, in addition to passive design, active strategies, and smart energy management. With solar energy being our most viable renewable energy resource, rooftop solar deployments on public and private buildings will be a key needle mover for our solar target. For JTC, we are expanding solar generation across our industrial roofs and vacant land with solar roof, Singapore's first solar grid model, and solar land, Singapore's first modular and movable solar farm model. We are on track to achieve our target of 100 megawatt peak by 2022, enough to power over 17,500 households. We are also working closely with BCA to develop a new initiative to spur solar adoption. We will continue to partner you to step up on green building efforts in the coming years, I urge you to use this pandemic as an opportunity to pivot and move towards the road ahead. 
Together, we are right through COVID-19 and emerge stronger to take on more demanding challenges tomorrow. I thank you for joining this forum and hope you will enjoy the rest of your program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hia. Our first presenter today is Architect Tang Kok Tai. Architect Tang is an associate partner with ADDP Architects LLP with over 20 years of experience in his field. He is an appointed member of the Building and Construction Authority Board and co-chairman of the Green Built Environment Advisory Committee. He is also the first vice president of the Singapore Green Building Council Board. Architect Tang's presentation today is titled Towards a Greener Tomorrow. Over to you, Architect Tang. Hi, good morning, everyone. Let me get the... Hi, good morning. I would like to start my uh, presentation um, on the... Sorry, there's a bit of slide running around. Give me a second. Okay, towards the greener tomorrow. Okay, my name is Kok Tai. I'm from ADDP Architects. So today, I would like to share uh, some of my presentation, not only as a private practitioner, but also as a, a Green Building Advisory Council uh, co-chair to share with you what are the things that we have been doing and how what are the things that we need to move uh, forward. So, uh, I'll just go down to the uh, net zero uh, buildings which have benefits to plane tree and human health and create resilience to communities and economies. So, I foresee that net zero carbon buildings are essential in post-COVID-19 economy recovery and keeping the climate action on track. Yeah. So, this green building is a sector with growth potential and it's also aligned with Singapore's strategic uh, objective. So first thing is green building and today climate crisis. What do building have to do with climate change? Right. So if you look at the overall uh, where we start in 2005, um, this is actually 15 years ago, uh, along with the rest of the global uh, community, Singapore uh, reduced the emission in support of the Paris Agreement with long-term uh, low emission development strategy, which is called the LEDS. So uh, our LEDS uh, has been prepared by government agency under the Inter-Ministerial Committee on Climate Change or IMCCC in consultation with academia, industry and civil society, whose opinion and expert view were gathered through technology work survey and various stakeholder engagement. So beyond 2030, Singapore aimed to significantly reduce our emission. So the uh, LEDS aspired to half the emission from its peak of 33 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2050, with a view to achieve a net zero emission as soon as viable in the second half of the century. So right in the middle are all the mitigation in transformation in the industry, economy and society. So Singapore emission profile, basically, if you look at the slide uh, on the left hand side, sorry, uh, if you look at the slide on the left hand side, the industrial sector largest contributor is 60%. And um, three quarter from the refinement, refining and petrochemical sectors, transport household building from the remaining 40%. And building actually one of the key mitigation strategies for the uh, climate change. So I want to uh, share with the uh, with everyone that actually we started uh, or Singapore started this journey in two zero zero five, which is fifteen years uh, ago. So I thought it's good to share with everyone uh, the processes and what they have gone through. So um, to chart the Singapore low carbon and climate resilient 
uh, future. So we have a 2005, we have the first green building master plan, uh, second green building master plan in 2009, 2014, the third one, and we are now embarking on the new uh, next lab. And the outcome is to reduce Singapore emission intensity by 36% in 2030. And the green, the more than 80% of our GFA across four area by 2030. So Singapore Green Master Plan in the next lab is important to meet our climate change commitments. So this is our green effort uh, since 2005. More than 40% of the Singapore building is uh, in terms of GFA is green. We have uh, 16 countries, more than 300 overseas green mark project. And the average energy use intensity have improved by 11% since 2008. Yeah. So this is uh, into the future where from 2005 uh, up to now March 2020, we are more than 40% green. And by 2030, we are targeting to have 80% uh, to be green. So one of the strategy in uh, moving ahead is pushing boundary in building energy efficiency. Although green building encompass a lot of uh, uh, holistic, including uh, energy, well-being, uh, connectivity, but energy is also one of the key component. So one of the target is to have super low energy building and making technology know-how available to encourage innovations and opportunities other than climate change uh, mitigations. So what is a super low energy building? So a typical building energy consumption profile uh, under common services are the one on the left. 60% is for cooling, 15% for lighting, uh, lift escalator 10%, ventilation 10%, remaining 5%. So in SLEV, actually we have uh, four strategies. One is a passive strategy, second is an active strategy, third is an energy management, and lastly is renewable energy. I will share with you one or two case study later on how this is being done in Singapore and has been easily achieved. So this is developing best in class in super low energy building standard. Uh, we are targeting to improve the uh, energy efficiency standard for new non-residential building uh, to hit about 60% uh, uh, down the road. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. So today we have about 55 super low energy building projects with eight industrial stakeholder and some of the listed uh, project are you know institutional uh, military camp uh, office retail uh, one of the missing component here is actually uh, residential so the next uh, target will be to encourage more residential building to go for super low energy building so there is a business case on energy saving over a uh, building life cycle. If you look at the chart here, a green, green mark rating for a uh, super low energy building, uh, there's a cost, green cost premium of about 1 to 4.6%, but the simple payback is about 2.11 to 5.7. So there is a net positive saving over building life cycles, which increase with higher standard of energy efficiency over the 2005 baseline. And there's an upfront, although there's an upfront premium, uh, is paid back within a life building life cycle with further energy saving beyond payback period. A separate analysis conducted on six completed super low energy building. Uh, project shows consistent result where the green cost premium uh, with one is to 4.6% as mentioned earlier on and payback of two to 5.8 uh, years. And there's a medium uh, NPV of saving about $250 uh, per square meters. Okay. So I just share with you two case study. One is uh, Savannah Jurong uh, campus. Uh, basically the strategy is to uh, have four uh, passive strategies, which on the building and facade optimization to achieve a uh, low ETTV. Uh, active strategies using the underfloor air distribution and displacement ventilation system, along with smart lighting control, 
uh, smart energy management using the uh, integrated building control system to monitor and control lighting, thermostat, plug load, etc. Uh, live energy and water management dashboard. And lastly, is the renewable energy using photovoltaic. The second project is actually the NUS SDE for using the four same principle, uh, where the messing to promote comfortable natural vent spaces, large roof uh, eave overhang, and to aid for ventilation and also to prevent uh, rain from going in. Active strategies, hybrid cooling system of mechanical vent and ceiling fan to set at a higher temperature. Uh, smart energy management, extensive sensor for lighting and cooling system, and renewable energy, latest high efficiency PV panels to offset 100% of its energy consumption. But if you notice the two case study, basically they are almost uh, low rise and mid rise. So one of the challenges for SLEB building is uh, how to design uh, super low energy building in, uh, in a high rise building typology and in an urban setting. Next one. Yeah. So these are all the super low energy building stakeholders today. So you have developers, you have developers and uh, sorry, yeah, you have developers uh, and building owners. You have all the uh, ESD consultants and architects and M and E. So um, down the road, obviously, um, the we hope to grow this. Uh, more people to come in so that there will be more uh, buildings that can achieve the SLEB. So one of the key opportunities lately, if you notice from newspaper, is um, green financing. So Singapore regional leader is a regional leader in green financing in ASEAN and green building takes up 43% of share. Uh, and if you look at the chart on the left, basically the growth is tremendous from 100 billion to 1.5 billion in 2018 and to 5.4 billion in 2019. And recently, if you notice in newspaper, there are more and more uh, institutions is going into green financing, which I think later a speaker from DBS will share with you more on this uh, green financing. So here, I also want to share with you uh, on the private practitioner side, uh, what my institute, uh, Singapore Institute of Architects have come up with. And they've come up with uh, uh, what they call a new SIA Green Book. And there is actually a seven step uh, to achieve this uh, sustainable design in the, uh, in the uh, context of uh, Singapore Institute of Architects. Yeah. So one, the first one is actually education and integration, basically to uh, share with clients what is good uh, in terms of sustainability in, in their projects. Uh, climate actions, basically to make sure that the building have uh, respond to climate. Natural capital, biophilic, resource management, uh, recycle materials, uh, urban harmony, connectivity with surrounding uh, buildings and communities health and well-being, which is another important issue now because of the COVID-19 cross ventilation, uh, adaptability and longevity, longevity, where buildings, um, if can be conserved, will be better to be conserved and uh, to, to construct when it's necessary. Yeah. So these are all in, in, in tandem with the United Nations Guide to come up with these uh, seven steps for the uh, SIA Green Guidebook. So one of the key things that I want to share with you is what's the pandemic impact on green buildings? Right? So what are the emphasis in green building post COVID era? So obviously the global pandemic has brought a new norm and the line between work from home and work in the office have blurred. Uh, so the quality of our living space and our working space has become uh, even more paramount. So COVID-19 has brought the link between the built environment and human health uh, into focus. The health and well-being of building occupants is steadily inching to the forefront. The place we live, work and play must also be safe and healthy. Yeah. So um, obviously indoor air quality is important and has a direct immediate impact on uh, human health well-being. 
Uh, indoor air quality can be many times worse uh, than the outdoors if it's not managed carefully. And a recent study suggested that enhancing the IAQ could be as effective as reducing aerosol transmission of viruses as vaccinating 50 to 60% of the population. So obviously, uh, green building will have a metric on how to make building uh, healthier and building owners and tenants can take steps to create, create greener, healthier and pandemic proof uh, workplace premises. Uh, some, some of the strategy used is that uh, to emphasize on indoor air quality and well ventilated indoor space. Um, there will be ultraviolet C lights to aid you to remove airborne bacteria and viruses. Uh, demand controlled ventilation and also a hybrid cooling system where uh, a hybrid between mechanical ventilation and natural ventilation uh, for office building as well. So we see that this will be a coming trend uh, down the road. So uh, the, the Green Building Master Plan will also be addressing some of these issues. So this is actually uh, BCA uh, uh, new standard for building design and ventilation guideline in post COVID-19. Uh, so there are five steps that uh, building owners and tenants can take uh, to create a healthier offices as recommended by together with uh, SGBC. So uh, good lighting, indoor air quality, interior layout and active design, biophilia and wheels and noise and acoustic are some of the key components to make a pandemic proof uh, a workplace. Yeah. So moving on, uh, what is important is for call for a collective action from the community, right? So uh, although uh, in SGBC and BCA and all the people uh, attending uh, to their seminar, uh, I'm sure you have uh, believe in what is green building. But what, what happened to the people outside of this industry? And what do people think about green building? And what can you and I do as users and consumers to, to make our environment better? Right. So, one of the, so I will share with you some of the snapshots on public engagement inside for the uh, SG, uh, Singapore Green Building Master Plan. Yeah. So people um, want more ambitious action um, for green building to tackle the impact of um, climate changes. Uh, obviously, uh, people want green building. Uh, but the question always I always ask is uh, how much are they willing to invest or pay, uh, whether it is good to have to some people or must have to other people, right? Well, people also express from the survey there's an urgent need to take climate action through the greening of Singapore building in the next uh, five to ten years. I mean, for obvious reason now, uh, the sea level is rising and uh, basically we have uh, more flooding than before because of climate change. Um, in, in Singapore context, uh, because of our low-lying land, uh, actually 30% of our land is actually uh, below 5 meters of the uh, mean sea level. So I think the past 10-15 um, uh, years, 70% uh, of Singapore coastline are protected by hard structures, uh, for, it, for example, sea walls. So there's an urgent need to tackle this in, in Singapore context because it's affecting us in, uh, on a daily basis. Yeah. So people are also calling for more uh, education and awareness on the benefits of green building to encourage for behavioral change. So that's why uh, there's a lot of engagement on the ground. Uh, the primary target not only uh, building user but also the um, the uh, teenagers, the students from the uh, from the academia as well. So in this uh, in this sense, uh, SGBC and BCA have engagement commissioning uh, exercise. Uh, it's actually led uh, by the uh, BCA CEO and SGBC presidents. Uh, it's a half day workshop. Uh, before the COVID-19 uh, um, uh, lockdown. So uh, some of the takeaways take uh, at these uh, seminars was the need for a higher and more ambitious standard. 
uh, there's a need to look beyond infrastructure into consumption pattern and make life cycle of behavioral change to get the buy-in and bring the relevant stakeholders on board. And there's a need to raise awareness and challenge common to challenge common uh, misconceptions. So beyond infrastructure, what you and I can do, uh, basically, if you look at the slide on the left, uh, building owners and tenant electricity consumption uh, on office, 51% uh, by building owner, 49% by tenants, retail, 47 by building owners, and 53% by tenant. So there need to be a collective uh, effort, uh, not only from building owner, but from tenant as well uh, to achieve this target. So they are, uh, uh, two strategies. One is the SGBC BCA Behavior Change Training Program, which is already in place. Uh, it's the first of its kind training program to build capability in individuals to drive sustainability through engaging other users uh, to demonstrate sustainable behavior. There's also an outreach program, uh, BCA, SGBC, and SGAA. This is to raise awareness on the benefit of using a BCA Green Mark Building. Uh, rating and quality homes to the public, especially home buyers and estate agents. So these are the ground effort that the um, BCA and SGBC have been working on to encourage more um, uh, ground up support uh, and encouragement to, to meet the target of the uh, 2030 and beyond. Yeah. So with that, uh, I end my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Architect Tang. Our next presenter today is Ms. Meruniza Zafa. Uh, Meruniza Zafa joined DBS in 2018 as part of the Responsible Finance Sustainability Team of DBS Institutional Banking Group, IBG, in Singapore. Her work focuses on the ongoing evolution and implementation of the bank's responsible financing framework and environmental and social issues relating to the bank's lending activities and transactions. Ms. Zafa's presentation today is titled Singapore's Green Financing Landscape and Opportunities for Buildings. Over to you, Ms. Zafa. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for having me um, today to speak about sustainable finance and what it means for the uh, building um, sector in Singapore and of course the road to green recovery and opportunities for, for buildings. Um, the building and construction space in Singapore has undergone transformational changes, as we know, um, as we continue to adapt to climate change and pivot um, towards a lower carbon uh, economy with green financing at an all time high. Um, the role of financial institutions is significant uh, in this transition to a lower carbon economy by providing green financing solutions um, such as green loans. Uh, and bonds and um, lending to catalyzing capital markets, tapping into increasingly critical opportunities uh, while creating positive impact. However, uh, it is important to say that the success of this transformation is not dependent on green financing alone, but also requires uh, collaboration amongst uh, different stakeholders, the builders, the tenants, um, regulators, and, and other stakeholders. So. Um, we see that support for green financing will continue to stay strong in Singapore uh, with very exciting opportunities for the future. Um, of course, we know why uh, green buildings are crucial and why sustainable finance is crucial for uh, those green buildings. Um, in 2015, the EU and, and, and uh, globally, a lot of governments uh, around the world committed to the objectives of a more sustainable economy and society when we agreed to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, and to achieve them by 2030 and the Paris Agreement, of course, on climate change. And uh, the goal, you know, is, is to focus on promoting resource and energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure and um, providing green jobs. But also the building industry has a major role to play in preventing waste um, through reduction, recycling, reuse, and, and of course the circular economy principles um, where resources are not wasted. 
And we see that uh, reflected in the Singapore uh, Sustainable Singapore Blueprint as well. Um, we are all aware that um, Singapore's water conservation and resilience is a very integral part of um, the, the future plans. Um, and we've done an incredible job here on that waste management and um, and overall just being a more sustainable economy in a post COVID-19 world. We are looking at, of course, rebuilding more sustainable and resilient uh, financial markets. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and we, what we see is a lot of optimism in the industry. So the financial system, of course, can significantly influence whether we are moving towards sustainability and, and support that progress um, made against environmental and social goals. So focusing on green building seems like a natural uh, choice. We have seen a very huge demand um, for uh, for green financing, and we um, we only we're only seeing it grow from strength to strength. Um, of course, uh, when we look at Singapore's green financing landscape, um, we kind of you know notice that um, there is an increased demand for green buildings for green financing. Investors are looking at it. We um, uh, basically need for industries to avail the green financing available the support and the funding available to make this change happen. To achieve the 2030 targets, corporations and investors are using this opportunity to keep emissions and um, a, a, a low and or moving towards an even lower level of emissions if they have achieved a certain uh, level of um, sustainability, good sustainability performance. And so to do this, we, we obviously need to continue offering healthy green spaces um, in, in Singapore. At DBS, we feel that we have a big role to play. Sustainability has been a big part of our um, uh, strategy, our direction internally and externally. We, we look at our own footprint, but then we also look at how we can be a responsible financer of, um, of uh, projects, of uh, supporting borrowers who are like-minded to uh, move their business models towards greener, um, darker shades of green. So at the dawn of this new decade, we, we feel that um, you know, ESG, environmental social, social governance, is becoming an important and more uh, bigger part of, of corporations' um, agenda. And sustainable finance is no longer a niche topic for the environmentally conscious um, business investors or uh, other stakeholders, we, we see it becoming more and more mainstream, um, centering on you know profitability, risk reduction, uh, human capital development, and and diversity. So, um, as we uh, see, you know, during COVID year, it's been it's been an interesting year for for all sectors, but um, we don't see the interest waning at all. We we look at uh, investment programs to rebuild and to build green, um, to, to have environmental considerations kind of hardwired into both the funding and the building side. So an example is, you know, green bonds market, which continues to grow rapidly and the pace is only increasing. Um, so post COVID is a big opportunity to make the switch to a sustainable, a more sustainable economy. And we have a financial sector that's ready and waiting to be that mechanism through which green money flows. At DBS, we uh, started off um, three years ago on this uh, responsible financing journey. And, um, you know, first year we did um, more than 10, uh, about 12 um, uh, uh, green, you know, ESG link loans and green loans. And, and we since then have completed more than 100 green transactions and that includes ESG link loans, that includes uh, green loans, which is of course the uptake is very high from the uh, real estate sector, uh, social bonds and green bonds. Um, uh, they, you know, have had such a uh, an interest from from different players, especially in the real estate uh, market as well. And so social and green bonds have a stated purpose. And so they can be launched specifically to fund green building projects. And we see this as an exciting area of growth as well. So, you know, the green bond market uh, exemplifies how an appropriate 
a regulatory framework can drive market incentives to align with overall um, social responsibility. Although different organizations have, you know, their own taxonomies and standards to define green bonds, but uh, I think green buildings uh, is one of the easiest cases to apply this to um, because the proceeds are actually going to green projects which are quite easy to identify and there are certifications available for that such as the BCA um, uh, green mark certification of course and external reviews are uh, easier to get done so these are this is quite um, a no-brainer as we see it and of course these developments um, in, in the taxonomies and the green bond and the green loan market are met with enthusiasm by market participants. Um, we also see um, green uh, clear benefits from green buildings uh, for a corporation's reputation to cover its cost in the long term and, and its employees and going green can be in, exciting in other ways too. Um, uh, of course, uh, we we see that uh, there is interaction and cooperation between between the lenders, and we um, find it quite exciting to partner with uh, with clients who are looking to make that real change in their strategy. So um, we also feel that in Singapore, um, it, it is it is uh, it's absolutely uh, brilliant that the regulator has acknowledged um, that financial prosperity and social progress uh, must go hand in hand. So ESG and sustainability, of course, is a huge part of that plan. And we see enabling factors that drive this movement. Um, so there's regulatory support uh, to create an enabling environment that um, has the ability to create those drivers. Uh, we, of course, see the MAS Green Finance uh, Plan and the MAS has also come out with um, the Green and Sustainability Link Loan uh, Grant Scheme. Um, which will be effective next year and uh, it's the first of its kind globally and we see and we welcome these moves and see that um, there is uh, a, an environment being created here whereby it will uh, be the natural choice for uh, companies to look at green financing. Um, of course, you know, there has been this um, thinking that uh, green financing is just for large corporations, but we, with, with this grant, and we feel that, you know, um, we have been saying it for, for a while that it is definitely not just for SMEs, uh, sorry, not just for large corporations, but also for SMEs and medium-sized organizations. And sustainable finance is not just another type of investment practice or financing practice. It's, it's a complete mindset shift. Um, and, and we see this and we see that um, future growth uh, depends on how quickly and effectively we're able to um, respond to environmental ch challenges by providing that financing, um, especially uh, issues that are, uh, that are very critical to Singapore, uh, such as the, the green building um, and construction space. And we feel that, you know, capital allocation processes uh, are truly becoming greener. We look at financial institutions across the board and see uh, consumption behaviors and, and the demand for these green financing products is uh, increasing rapidly. So um, we uh, absolutely feel that uh, this is going to be an area of uh, tremendous growth. And in that sense, we, um, you know, we continue to offer and diversify the green products that we offer. Um, we have seen uh, clients uh, in Singapore come to us with um, a large number of different options uh, for ESG linked loans and not just straight up green loans, but also uh, sustainability linked bonds, which are quite new in the market. And um, so, of course, they are, uh, there's, they've sparked a huge interest as well. So we, of course, are looking at uh, all of these things and, and we see the trend uh, increasing quite rapidly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zafa. Our next presenter today is Ms. Ms. Lee Eiling. Eileen is the Head of Urban Planning and Design of Keppel Urban Solutions, 
a business unit of the Capital Group that aims to become an end-to-end -end integrated master developer of smart, sustainable precincts in the Asia-Pacific region. Ms. Lee's presentation today is titled Delivering New Model of Sustainable Urban Development. Over to you, Ms. Lee. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, everyone. I'm very honored today to be able to join this distinguished panel to discuss a topic that is close to many of our hearts, how to recover and build back greener. So today, my presentation will be covering topics in relation to sustainable urbanization, including city infrastructure, planning, and design. We are living in exciting times with complex challenges, with urbanization rates set to increase from 55% to 70% in the next 30 years. Cities will grow and new cities will surface, the rate of which is equivalent to building one New York City every 40 days. Most of the growth will be witnessed in China, India, and Africa. To understand the scale in absolute terms, the number of buildings you will see in 2060 will be double of what you see today. And this substantial increase in global building stock will deeply worsen the climate change if it's not planned and executed carefully. As architect Tang has mentioned earlier, the built environment already contributes to nearly 40% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is before taking into account other sources of emissions that are related to urbanization, including transport, deforestation, and land use changes. So how much time do we have left to reverse the damage we have done? And what does it mean by staying well within two degrees Celsius warming, as stated in the Paris Agreement? If you see the chart on the right, if we target to limit warming to 2 degrees Celsius, our pathway would have to follow the purple dash line, which means we have to peak emission by 2020, which is this year, and to be carbon neutral by 2050. And if the global emissions peak any later, the chances of staying within safe limits will be diminished. Extreme storm events, unbearable heat waves, changes in water supply, food supply, and loss of wildlife may become inevitable. So in Capo, we believe that sustainable urbanization is the core of our business. Earlier in May this year, we released our Vision 2030 Long-Term Strategy Plan, reaffirming our commitment to focus on and deliver solutions for sustainable urbanization. So in this chart, you will see some of the solutions uh, that Capo have include LNG bunkering, offshore wind farms, district heating and cooling, 5G infrastructure, green data centers, waste to energy plants, which I will illustrate further. We are streamlining our businesses into three key pillars, energy and environment, urban development, and connectivity. And all these three pillars are supported by our asset management business as a platform for capital raising and capital recycling. So how do our three pillars work together to deliver sustainable urbanization? You will see here our sustainable urbanization framework, our three pillars work together in a circular manner to deliver large-scale urban projects, laying the foundation with resilient infrastructure, building regenerative urban development, and enabling uh, responsive digital optimization, which will in turn help to optimize the performance of, say, our next wastewater treatment plant or the design of our next smart township. So we believe that with our integrated business approach that spans various uh, diverse sectors and specialization, we are well placed to create impactful outcomes for a greener future. So talking about impact, we believe that to achieve sustainability targets in the built environment, we would have to work across all urban skills, right from the top from energy generation, next to city planning, building design, and last but not least, circularity within each of the tiers and across all three other tiers. I will provide some examples for each of these. So first, energy generation. We need to expedite adoption of clean fuel and renewables and plan for efficient storage and distribution of clean energy to where it is required. Some of the renewable projects that Keppel has undertaken include offshore wind farms in Germany and Taiwan, the first LNG bunkering vessel in Singapore, and the first floating green DC uh, data center park, which could be powered by hydrogen and could using 
coal energy that is harnessed when LNG we gasify. We are also uh, doing R&D to, to explore whether we can use seawater since the structure is floating to use seawater for cooling as well. Before I go on to the topic of city planning, I'd like to share a recent report that showed some interesting findings. So how has COVID impacted carbon emissions for this year? In fact, COVID has uh, affected the largest decrease in carbon emissions in history, 8.8% to be exact, an effect that is far larger than previous economic crisis or even World War II. The large portion of reduction is due to drastically reduced ground transport demand as many cities went into lockdown. So will 2020 be offering a glimpse of the future city living that is largely self-sufficient and greener? It is critical for all cities to have a long-term comprehensive master plan that is followed through as the circulation networks, the land use programming and defined development parameters and densities will intrinsically affect commuting patterns, quality of life, and in turn, carbon emissions. So most of us will be familiar with this diagram I'm showing on this slide. It's the HGB town model. In recent months, you would have heard a new term coined by mayors around the world, the 15-minute city, a new way of planning in response to the new normal. However, it's interesting to note that this is exactly what Singapore has been doing since the 1960s. So I believe we should be proud of the good foundation we have built in Singapore and continue to leverage on it. This successful model of town planning has also served us well as we venture overseas to implement large-scale master development projects such as Tianjin Eco City and Saigon Sport City in Ho Chi Minh. And moving forward, besides good physical planning, there is huge opportunity for large-scale developments to demonstrate closed-loop infrastructure systems where there is economy of scale for PV deployment and treatment of organic waste and wastewater in situ, which can then generate biomass energy or compost or recycled water to be fed into district cooling. I believe this moving forward would be an area that uh, is worth working on and requires a lot of concerted effort from different disciplines. And underpinning the different systems, we have a digital master plan for all our large master development projects that leverages on our Kappa Smart City operating system to collect and standardize data on energy, waste, water, space usage, microclimate, air quality, vehicular and human traffic, equipment status, such that rules can be applied, analytics and automation can take place, and task making as the operations more efficient, intuitive, responsive, and most importantly, less resource intensive. Next, I'll go on to building design. Architect Tang has covered this topic quite extensively earlier. So I would just like to add one point that computation design, computational design is something that we should not neglect. Architects, environmental scientists, and software designers can work closely to develop new tools that can help designers make informed decisions, quickly determining the entire life cycle impact of a building. It can help us decide down to the choice of glass, ACMB systems, the tiles, the extent of your overhang, where to place your solar panels, construction techniques, and even the recoverability of materials at the end of life for our buildings. And this would be very daunting a task if we don't have some computational help. For existing buildings, energy audit retrofitting with more efficient cooling and lighting system, optimization of energy usage with digital twin simulation and analytics apps based on user feedback have been proven to save 20 to 30% of energy consumption. And in Pepper Bay Tower, the first commercial development to be fully powered by renewable energy, we also make use of the solar energy that is harvested at our offshore and marine yards in Tuas to create a true uh, carbon neutral building. So other than passive design, active design, there are also new business models that are evolving. Many companies like Capital District Heating and Cooling are moving towards energy performance contracting model 
or low capex model, where the solutions provider finance part or all of the capex and get paid with the cost savings derived by energy savings over a period of time. So I believe moving forward, we will need more of such innovations to, to come forward and to change how we look at existing buildings retrofitting. And lastly, on adopting circular policies and practices, there are many areas that we can work on. Sorry, I have to go back to that slide. Okay. Yeah, for circular practices, there are many areas that we can work on, include, including circular procurement to ensure that our supply chains are also sustainable or circular design to reimagine ways that building component, components can be dismantled and reused at the end of life. Another illustration would be TWAS Nexus, Singapore's first integrated waste management facility that is co-located with TWAS Water Reclamation Plant that is designed to tap on synergies and close the waste water energy loops, whereby the byproduct of one facility becomes the resource for another. For instance, the sludge that is produced by the water reclamation plant is actually mixed with the organic waste stream that is collected by the waste um, and material recovery uh, plant to increase biogas production that will increase the efficiency of the WTE plant. So, in other words, moving forward, we should adopt circular policies and practices by default. And this can only happen if we build all our resource streams, waste, energy, water, in, a, in an integral way and bring different stakeholders together at the drawing board. So in summary, this is a very critical window of opportunity for the built environment sector. If we do not take drastic action in this decade, it may be too late. We would have to build stronger bridges between designers and engineers, landlord and utility providers, regulators and innovators, so that we can co-create with systems design approach to ensure that every building we add tries its best to reduce its burden on the entire ecosystem. For new buildings, high energy efficiency would be easier to achieve with new technology. But the more pressing issue is to work on the old buildings, how to retrofit them cost effectively and intelligently without tearing them down. I've talked about clean power, and using waste as resource as a means to avoid emissions. Good city planning and bioclimatic buildings to reduce emissions. But other than avoidance and reduction, we should also work on adaptation and sequestration efforts simultaneously to manage and mitigate our climate risk. Last but not least, we can only achieve our aim of reversing climate change if there is concerted effort and close collaboration from all parties in the public, private sectors, as well as the community. COVID-19 has sent a sudden shock to the world and its economy, but it may also present the best opportunity and catalyst to make material change on how people work, travel, and live in a more sustainable way. So let's deliberate on it to build back greener. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. We have now come to the panel discussion session. It will be chaired by Ms. Yvonne So, Executive Director of the Singapore Green Building Council. Also joining us this morning in the panel are Ms. Lynette Leong, Chief Sustainability Officer of Capital Land Group, representing RADAS, Mr. Kelvin Chun, Group Director of Engineering, JTC Corp, and Mr. Ang Kian Seng, Group Director, Environmental Sustainability, BCA. Ms. So, over to you, please. Um, thank you, Christina, for the introductions. Um, good morning, everyone. And I hope that you have been inspired and energized after hearing the presentations from our speakers earlier. The future ahead of us is full of opportunities and I'm really looking forward to be a part of the transformation of our built environment in the coming years. So we are very privileged today to have a distinguished and diverse panel of experts that will help us delve deep into this topic and share their insights on how we can collectively emerge greener and stronger. There is growing consensus worldwide that the two crises, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change can be tackled simultaneously. 
And we can do that by rebuilding economies that are greener and more resilient and by creating new jobs and industries. And to that end, the Singapore government has created an emerging stronger task force to guide Singapore's uh, economic recovery. So I would just like to take reference from uh, some of the work of this task force. Uh, the Emerging Stronger Task Force started their deliberations in May earlier this year, and they have identified six key economic shifts that have been exacerbated by COVID-19 and that are reshaping the global economy. And uh, these six are, firstly, a changing global order, Secondly, a rebalance between efficiency and resilience in supply chains and production. Third, the need to accelerate digital transformation and innovation. Fourth, changes in consumer preferences. Fifth, an increased focus on sustainability, both from the environmental and social angles. And lastly, the acceleration of industry consolidation and churn. So perhaps it's a good time now for me to pose the first question to our panelists uh, and I will um, point to Kelvin. Kelvin, um, we have heard earlier about how JDC plays a major role in supporting Singapore's industries with the development of buildings and infrastructure and you also assist other government agencies with your deep engineering expertise and R&D. So uh, with these key vantage points, uh, has JDC observed the six trends identified by the Emerging Stronger Task Force, uh, perhaps in the form of uh, requirements from companies who are expanding in Singapore or wanting to invest and enter into Singapore? Uh, and also, could you also share if it is indeed the case that there's an increased focus on environmental and social sustainability? Thanks, Yvonne. Over uh, to you, yeah, Kelvin. Yeah, hi. Thanks. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Thanks for the question. Actually, it's a very relevant question. Uh, indeed, we have seen uh, such a shift. And uh, frankly, when we were looking at the, when the COVID first happened, we were thinking that perhaps it will dampen the, the movement. But we have not seen that. In fact, we have seen the whole uh, movement strengthening. Uh, with, if you can look at the news recently or over the past one year, we have seen many major uh, corporations uh, declaring very ambitious sustainability targets uh, and most of them have set the timeline as 2030 as a time to be net zero in their operations uh, by 2030. So what it means is that so when companies come to us uh, we have seen them talk about sustainability uh, more and more and in some cases translating to actual implementation on the ground. For example they are asking now for uh, developments that are greener. So that uh, gives us the built environment a very uh, good opportunity, especially for our uh, built environment companies. Why I say so is because uh, when we ask them, why are you looking at uh, sustainability? So it's a question that we, we like to find out. And uh, they give us basically two answers. Uh, firstly, is um, they say that the consumers are asking for it. So if they don't, uh, give what the consumer wants, their bottom line will suffer because their products uh, may not be able to sell. The second point is that uh, the countries themselves where they are setting out uh, their plants are also demanding that their operations are now uh, has to be leaner. Uh, this is also partly because uh, every country has to also uh, meet the Paris Accord. Uh, they have also committed to the uh, Paris Agreement. And therefore, what I'm trying to say here is that for our built environment companies, uh, I, I think there's a lot of a good head start that we have done in Singapore on green building. Uh, it's a lot of opportunities for them to uh, support these companies, uh, not only when they come to Singapore to build their buildings, but also uh, in the region, which is the, if you we all understand, will be the main engine of growth in the whole, uh, whole, world, whole world economy. So, yeah, I just like to urge that I think perhaps uh, we should press on. Uh, our BE companies should be the elite in this area. And I think there will be a lot of opportunities from there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kelvin. It is uh, very heartening to hear of the strong commitments of companies and uh, their green ambitions. 
So maybe I will turn to um, Lynette. Uh, Lynette, as the CSO in one of uh, Asia's largest real estate group, uh, Capital Land has a wide spectrum of customers from across um, the real estate classes, ranging from commercial, uh, retail, business parks, industrials, and I think also logistics. So as Capital Land encountered the same experience as JDC, and uh, what are the global economic shifts that Capital Land has had to deal with? Thanks, Yvonne, for the question. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here to represent both Capital Land and Radas. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a, a privilege to be here. Um, yes, Yvonne, as what you mentioned, um, we are in a actually pretty complex position because of our large uh, portfolio of asset classes, as well as in more than 220 cities around the world. So we're seeing different kinds of trends. I think first beginning with corporate tenants, uh, they are actually, a lot of them are driving this wave, uh, beginning with those that, are, that have signed on to the RE100 uh, commitment. So RE100 represents renewable energy uh, 100%. So they, uh, a lot of these companies, now, now the list is growing, there are more than 200 now and that list is actually growing. Um, they have committed to uh, having 100% of the energy consumption uh, with renewable energy by a certain time period, some as early as 2025, 2020, 2030. So, and a lot of these are our tenants. I'm sure Kelvin will agree that in JTC's portfolio, a lot of these MNCs are in their portfolio. Many of them are tech companies such as Facebook, Google and, and the likes. Uh, even I think DBS has signed on to that too. So these are our corporate, many of them are corporate tenants and uh, they demand that kind of uh, uh, requirements from landlords. So I think that's one. And uh, our we have a lot of corporate tenants as our lodging tenants as well. So they occupy our service residences around the world. And uh, when they come to us, they also give us a long list of uh, requirements for being sustainable. So not just renewable energy, but in other uh, sustainable practices like waste management, use of uh, whether there's any plastic bottles, you know, down to the nitty gritty of that. Um, and uh, some of them, uh, it's not just on the environmental side. Uh, so when we talk about sustainability, we're looking at environment, social, and governance, ESG. Uh, so environmental side will be your uh, energy, water, waste. That's primarily it. Uh, but on the social side, it's also about how we treat our supply chain, our workers. And uh, we have to ensure that there's no, uh, no forced labor, no child labor. You know, so it goes down to that level of detail. And then on the governance, it's, it's quite uh, quite quite easy understood and uh, you must uphold uh, high integrity uh, honesty and and so forth so so there are more requirements now coming from tenants uh, around the world and uh, get Singapore given that we are such an open economy and uh, a lot of our tenants are MNCs that is that driving force um, and then on the retail side um, as what Kelvin has mentioned, the shoppers, the consumers are also looking at that. In actual fact, uh, Nielsen, which is a very well-known uh, research company, uh, they, they did a poll of uh, more than 30,000 online consumers in 60 countries worldwide. And uh, the, the finding is that consumers are willing to pay more for sustainable products and services. Uh, if you go to the shopping malls, like for example, our latest one, Funan, which is designed to be very sustainable, catering to the future of retail, a lot of them don't even want to have plastic bags anymore. They all carry around their own recycling bags. You know? so, so there is that wave amongst the younger population. So in the residential sector, unfortunately, we haven't seen a lot yet. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, residential buyers will say, okay, I'm going to pay more for a uh, sustainable uh, green uh, 
project. <laughs> but yeah, but I think that will that wave will come, you know, the younger population. They may not still want to pay more, but then I think the demand is there. So that's that's the, the kind of uh, trend we're seeing. Um, and uh, uh, on the environmental side with, with uh, COVID, I think there's more attention being paid to health and well-being, which is uh, what architect Tang has mentioned earlier. So, so I think that's uh, also another area which uh, we all have to pay attention to. And I don't want to forget one group of, uh, 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 I would say, tenants or you can call it customers. And these are our investors and uh, like, like the, our, the, the banks, for example, they're all, a lot of them are looking at, at uh, uh, ESG principles. So in uh, Capital Land being a public listed company, we rely on a lot of our investors because we are capital intensive business. And our investors are also demanding that companies are not just look, they're not just looking at financial gain anymore. When they assess the quality of a company to invest in, they're looking at the ESG quality how much uh how how good how well performing they are on the sustainable sustainability side yeah so i think there's a ecosystem of uh, uh players that are moving towards the same direction thanks lynette um i was just at uh funan last weekend and it is really interesting and it was bustling and I'm so happy to see that there's a retail mall that's doing so well. But I think the concept, um, it's really great, uh, all the interactions. And uh, a shout out for one of your tenants, right? There's this really interesting uh, eco shop there. It's quite large. It's got quite a lot of um, different types of uh, goods. And I was uh, very intrigued by this, um, this, this dish washing and detergent and all that, right? Just using some salt solution. It was really interesting. I, I really am thinking of uh, buying that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Funan's doing very well. Okay, <laughs> sidetrack. <laughs> 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 Please give more business. <laughs> yeah, but it's a really nice mall. Uh, very interesting. I spent uh, quite a long time in it. Yep. Okay, uh, back to our topic. Um, so you mentioned about RE100 and uh, I saw a question on the Q&A uh, from uh, Mr. Joe Lam, and actually I, I, I feel the same way as him, that there is a lot of focus on operational uh, energy, but what about uh, embodied um, carbon emissions? I don't know, Lynette, maybe you can address this, then I would also want to ask uh, Kian Singh, uh, and maybe Koktai, seeing that the Green Building Master Plan review is underway, uh, what is uh, what are we going to do about uh, embodied emissions? Mm. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, embodied carbon is uh, under the, uh, you, you have the scope one, scope and two, and scope three. Scope, embodied carbon is under scope three. Yes. Uh, so it's, it means it's not a direct impact. Uh, so as a matter of fact, uh, Capital Land just launched our master plan, sustainability master plan, and embodied carbon is one of our targets to meet. Uh, it is not something that is um, easy because, uh, first of all, you need to set a certain baseline. In our, in our case, we have projects around the world, so it becomes a more complex matter, yeah. but we are determined to to uh, ensure that all we use sustainable materials and uh, it's, it's an exercise that we're doing. Um, I think the, uh, the question is, is also balancing cost as well. I and mean, as developers, we all have to look at both financial as well as the feasibility. But I think that uh, the, the key thing is that you have to go and you have to set the targets what targets we want to meet. So we, in our initial targets, we reduce it by 20%, but it is only our first target and we are going to step it up uh, in time to come. So for those who are listening in, sometimes it may be difficult to set a very ambitious target first, but you need to set something. And then along the way, you keep pushing the boundaries. So that's what we are doing. Um, I think the other matter is about uh, innovation because we need to, see what kind of new materials that can that we can employ that can reduce embodied carbon as well so um the other day we were we actually maybe just uh pen united uh, 
I don't have any interest in Penn United, but they were very nice to have invited mm -hmm. all of us, including our group CEO, to visit their plant. And we were very fascinated by the amount of uh, innovation they have put into reducing the amount of carbon emissions in their, their cement. You know, so that, that is uh, cement, we use cement in, in all our construction projects. So, so having a low carbon um, type of cement is actually very helpful to reducing embodied carbon. So I think we will encourage more innovation towards this area. I think BCA is uh, very keen on doing that too. Yep. Um, so uh, SGBC, we run a green building product certification scheme and uh, we are paying a lot of attention to you know, the main uh, carbon intensive materials like uh, cement, concrete and steel. Yep. So maybe um, I will ask uh, Kok Tai if uh, maybe to provide some comments on uh, how embodied emissions will be uh, addressed mm. in the green building master plan and maybe then can sing after that can add mm. on on perhaps uh, incentives mm. <laughs> well thanks uh Yuan. well if i remember correctly i think the embodied carbon uh was in the in the spotlight because uh it was recently included in the uh, World Green Building Council um, in the updated net zero carbon building uh, commitments. I think that, that is where it comes in. And um, if we understand the embodied carbon actually referred to the uh, carbon emission uh, released during the uh, manufacturing, uh, transportation and construction phases of a building. Uh, in this case, uh, in Singapore context, um, uh, I think in the Green Master Plan, uh, we did talk about this uh, and we we also concluded that some of the things that we can do and we cannot do because in Singapore, almost all our uh, building products are imported <laughs> um, and uh, whether it's imported by from a nearby country like Malaysia uh, or far away, you know, from Europe or China. Um, but it is a topic uh, that we are looking into closely, uh, but in the green, uh, the green master plan now, um, uh, that is a topic, but it is not, um, it is not conclusive at this moment. To be very frank, because it, it is something that we we are comfortable or we 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 must be able to achieve without um, sacrificing the 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 life food, the business side of it, isn't it? Uh, because like I said, the Singapore. Uh, it's a very unique uh, city-state island uh, with limited land. Uh, so we have our own challenges. So we have to be careful, uh, although it is an important uh, agenda, but we have to be careful how uh, it will affect uh, the, the economy and the life food of, of uh, Singaporean in that case. Yeah. Yeah. I think Lynette mentioned as well that it's a very uh, emerging area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kian Singh? Yeah, um, just want to maybe uh, echo um, Kok Tai. I think um, the discussion on embodied carbon is a bit complex because um, if it does look at how you extract the materials, then how you produce it, then how you transport it, and then uh, further processing before it goes into the building. So there's, there's quite a lot of steps. Um, I think we all along we have uh, recognized the needs to be uh, resource efficient so that includes uh, construction materials and that in a way will also reduce embodied carbon and and therefore even in the upcoming review of the green mark uh, all these are still important elements that we will include into the assessment and the evaluation um, I think if you if you hear uh, Lynette and and Kok Tai, the world is all moving towards a net zero, and whether is it embodied, whether is it operational carbon, everybody has to play the part. And then if you look at uh, China uh, committing to a deadline by twenty sixty, Japan and Korea by twenty fifty. So these are actually the workhouse of the whole world, the factories of the whole world, and if they commit to net zero, whether it's operational, it means that the embodied carbon of many materials, many products will be next to zero. 
So I think the whole world is coming together, together with enterprise. And uh, I suppose we have to plug into this. So I therefore mm. urge all the BE consultants to start to take an interest in this. And I think carbon can become a new currency, whether it's operational carbon or embedded carbon. Uh, the understanding, uh, the sophistication has to go up a few notches. Uh, you need to be able to converse with your stakeholders. Uh, increasingly, everybody will start to talk about carbon uh, besides the, the, the dollar. Yeah. So that will become the second currency. Already there's a common tax, although it's quite low. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether I should be saying that we can expect it to go up <laughs> significantly <laughs> if you really want to uh, move the needle. But I mm -hmm. think uh, that, is, uh, that, that is for us to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, as for incentive, uh, as part of the master plan, we are, we are in discussion. And I think the, um, the direction would be that if you are able to move the leader to push the boundaries, then we want to see, we certainly want to come in to support. And, mm -hmm. and, and that is part of the transformation that we, of emerging stronger and emerging greener for the whole BE sector. Mm -hmm. So I think we are, we, are, we are happily working with SGBC and stakeholders mm -hmm. to come up with a good package. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, we only have the uh, financing where we share the risk. Uh, if you take up a loan uh, with some of the banks to do uh, building energy retrofit. Uh, so hopefully with this new master plan, we can complement this with a few more uh, schemes to really help the whole sector move forward to be greener and stronger. Yeah, thank you. Mm. So, yeah, sorry, Lynette, Yvonne. Please. Yeah. Can I just go ahead and uh, to follow up on what Ken Singh has said? I think, I think uh, there have been a lot of efforts by the various government agencies to try to drive this, and uh, we are seeing um, efforts being made to reduce costs. Um, mm. What is unclear at this moment is the value creation, and uh, so we by reducing costs naturally, if you look at the value of a property. If the cost is reduced, uh, the risk is lowered, you get better financing terms, hopefully reduce the interest rate, then you should see valuation of properties increase, right? And yet we are not seeing that. There's no direct correlation. Uh, and I've discussed this with uh, Ken Singh as well. So I think that is this missing piece that should come in into, and to complete the whole equation. You know, uh, Architect Tang has, meant, has given us uh, very good statistics to show that the, there's a reduction in cost by being SL, SLB. But mm. th is that translating to a higher valuation of property? Mm. It's still very, not yet, you know. So mm. I think that you need to close that equation. <laughs> yeah, I certainly agree <laughs> with uh, Lynette on that. Uh, I think increasingly we got to look at the top line rather than the bottom line so that uh, by going green you're actually creating value and, and that in yeah. a way may have to do with the carbon pricing that we have to start to uh, internalize and maybe even externalize and, and make it real so that mm -hmm. it will go into the valuation of your assets of your operations and everything else so i think that's something that maybe uh, going forward we, all of us has to have a better understanding and how to put it into the valuation Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Maybe uh, Yvonne, I, I want to uh, share something. I think yep. uh, you all know in business money talks. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I'm just always mooning this idea that what happens if the bank is uh, willing to uh, give loan to the purchaser, you know, uh, if the building is uh, green mark, platinum, uh, you know. So, I, I just want to uh, also maybe ask um, uh, uh, Miss uh, uh, Maruti from, uh, from DBS yeah? Yeah. Whether, there's such, whether there's such chance that uh, the bank uh, uh, will actually uh, keep better loan uh, rate uh, when, when a buyer is actually uh, buying a green building or even uh, uh, doing a green business for that matter. Yeah, mm. thanks. I'm yes, sure. So I I think, yeah, whether green finance uh, <laughs> applies to consumers, because it sounds yeah. it's very business-centric. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, um, absolutely. I think um, it, it's a very good point. And um, the cost of lending um, to, I think, it, not, not just DBS, I think worldwide, we're seeing the financial institutions are looking at um, the, you know, how sustainable a company is, their ESG performance before lending. Apart from the very basic, you know, um, from a risk point of view and uh, the due diligence that banks do, um, we also have um, incentives in place for uh, ESG linked financing. So th this may apply to, you know, the, the, the top kind of performers um, and where we set targets, but also it applies to um, corporations and, and, and you know, uh, that have never set targets before. I think Lynette made a point about, you know, targets. And I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, we are increasingly seeing uh, an uptake of ESG linked financing, be it loans or bonds. And um, of course, uh, ESG sustainability linked bonds are quite new on the market. But what we do see is the fact that uh, customers want to make that push our borrowers are looking to you know for that nudge which dbs is very happy to provide we want to incentivize our borrowers to perform better and to earn a discount so sustainability linked loans uh, work in that way where we uh, have mutually agreed uh, agreed upon targets and then at the achievement of those targets we give the borrower a discount so i think it serves as a um as as a as a definitely as an incentive as a push to help them uh, nudge them in the right direction and i think um we will increasingly see uh, uh more and more customers so since sgx has come out with their reporting requirement a few years ago we of course see uh companies producing sustainability reports. So the more organized they get, uh, you know, the more data they have, the more historical data they have, the more easily they can set targets, meaningful targets that help improve their performance. So we, at, uh, when we're structuring ESG linked loans and there's no cookie cutter approach, you know, we, we uh, structure each one individually, very catered to a particular borrower. We look at all this um, information and, and the historic trends and, and where, um, you know, companies can do better. And actually, we also, you know, of course, it's a mutual discussion, but we advise on, you know, where we think according to the industry sector, you know, GHG emissions, water, waste, what are the relevant uh, topics for them to improve upon? So absolutely targets are very important, but also, yes, uh, we, we do look at, um, you know, uh, sustainability linked financing offers better rates and discounts for uh, companies that want to improve and achieve those targets. And we've seen some very, very ambitious targets being set because uh, we've seen that a lot of our borrowers want to put that pressure on themselves and they see it as an opportunity to make that move um, you know, a, a bit more kind of aggressive push to move towards uh, net zero. Mm, thanks for that. Um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that uh, green finance uh, can also be accessed by uh, SMEs, right? And I think most SMEs wouldn't be producing uh, sustainability reports. So, um, how can you know smaller firms access green finance and what would you look at and what does it translate to is it uh, lower interest rates so yes uh, when we talk about discounts we do mean lower interest rates and that's a very good point uh, thank you for for making that point we um, don't always rely on a sustainability report per se so whilst I do agree that um, you know for SMEs uh, there is that mindset and sometimes you know it's not a huge priority to collate all this uh, data but um, for example, the, the first SME ESG link loan that DBS completed uh, for Choose Agriculture, um, they did not have a sustainability report. So what they were aiming to um, do, we um, you know discussed with them and we kind of talked about the fact that they were looking to get the humane care certification which already has about, which is, a, you know, quite progressive, but also extremely hard to achieve. So it's got 100 KPIs that they have to meet before their egg farm or chicken farm can be um, 
labeled as a humane uh, uh, farm animal care. Um, and, and, and for them, you know, the it, it's fascinating. The KPIs include, you know, the, the structure of where, how the hen will live, the lighting, even the way they sit on those pegs, you know, the angle at which they turn. It, it's, it's quite fascinating. So what we um, did was that we said, okay, you achieved this certification and we will give you a discount. So uh, for them to already achieve that um, and, and for us to give the discount, you know, we did not need a sustainability report. They were going to meet ESG targets that were already being set by an external party. We do uh, at DBS require external validation of, of targets. So we, you know, don't rely on just the borrowers words as saying, uh, you know, we've achieved these targets. We do uh, to, to keep the process robust and to ensure integrity and transparency in the process, we rely on external benchmarks. So in this case, in Choose Agriculture, the external certification is uh, the HFAC, wow. which is Humane Animal um, Farm Animal Care. And, and it was uh, an added bonus that um, they were going to supply the poultry waste to Aquapower uh, to convert to into biogas to generate electricity. So it was a win-win. There were a lot of environmental benefits. And of course, this was the first of its kind in Singapore. So we, we there are other ways, um, you know, and, and not just a sustainability report. And we're happy to, you know, recommend ideas and work with clients, depending on their business models, on, on how we can, we can structure something for them. So we've, we've also had in Indonesia, export uh, um, uh, financing for um, a, a company that was looking to, um, uh, uh, to uh, import wood. And for each uh, consignment that they used FSC certified wood, we would give them a discount. So, um, you know, there are many other ways and, uh, to, to be more sustainable, to be more, uh, to have better ESG performance. Mm. Mm. Well, our industry is um, has many certifications, so I'm sure we'll be able to find something to support that uh, green loan. Okay, um, um, I would like to turn a question to uh, Ken Singh. Um, we have heard a lot about um, how there will be there will be a lot of demand for sustainable development and there will be new business opportunities and this will probably require new capabilities from our workforce. Uh, so from the from v, VCA's viewpoint, what are some of the opportunities in green buildings and uh, where are some of the current gaps in capabilities? Uh, what are the skills that our companies and people should be looking to pick up in the coming years? Yeah, thanks Yvonne for the question. So just now we talk about embodied carbon. So I think the understanding of carbon, the accounting part, how how to um, how that makes uh, strengthen the business case for green buildings. I think we all must start to uh, to be uh, conversant in it. So that's that's one. I think in this current uh, pandemic, uh, we realize that the indoor air quality, the ventilation. It's actually something that uh, concerns many people and, and it's a topic that is uh, now being uh, discussed openly and in closed doors as well. So I think this is also another area that maybe we as BEs, as the BE sector have not looked at it uh, deeper enough. Uh, so I think we should uh, look at it as a means to improve two things. One is that the health and well-being of the people is important. So if you have good ventilation, uh, good IAQ for the people within, then I think you're likely to be, have a more resilient building in times of a pandemic. So I think that goes hand in hand. I think the other part about good ventilation is that I think in our tropical climate, uh, I hope we can not always uh, think about air conditioning. We should think about natural ventilation or maybe aided natural ventilation with fans. And that actually will help us get to net zero uh, faster than, than than anything else, if you ask me. So mm -hmm. instead of relying on air conditioning, let's think of uh, natural ventilation with fans as a as an option, as a as a default option. And that would mean that our BE uh, professionals must also begin to look at how you design your new developments, how you uh, 
ensure there's enough openings, uh, the layout, cross ventilation, all this will make a difference. Otherwise, your natural ventilation with fans might not work as well. So I think these are important skills that maybe it's good for us to uh, build up again. Uh, I think in the past, you were built on base passive design because mm -hmm. air conditioning was just not the norm. So I think going forward, uh, I hope we all of us can start to uh, intensify in this area and make our buildings more pandemic res resilient as well as energy efficient in the longer run. So I think that's, that's very important. So the other thing is also um, IAQ is something that is also quite hard to measure or quite hard to sense. Um, you, you want to see if there are solutions, innovations that will allow uh, people to pick, quickly pick up if the indoor air quality is uh, bad or something. Because right now if you walk into a building, you don't really know whether the CO2 is uh, high or whether there are some other gases that may not, uh, that, that, that has no odor, then you won't know uh, what is the quality of the, the environment. Mm -hmm. so, so this is maybe somewhere the, I hope the R&D community can uh, innovate and come up with a device that will allow all of us to track the IAQ wherever we go. Then we can quickly mm -hmm. feedback to the building operators so that they can do uh, changes, adjustments to the ventilation and the air conditioning. And that means that the FM, in Colleagues will have to up their game as well and help us maintain a, a very highly energy efficient, at the same time, healthy, uh, good IAQ for, for all of us. Yeah, I think, I think, I thought I want to emphasize on these three things, carbon, uh, ventilation, and maybe some sensing to make, make our job uh, so much uh, efficient. Yeah. That Thank you. goes with the all the digital plans that the government has, right? Yeah, precisely. I think you have, yeah. I think data is one thing, but also the, the sensing. I think right now, go around, the, the, you're using CO2 as a, as a proxy. Uh, so maybe that's not the, whether we, there are other ways to, to do it better and more accurate. Yeah. Mm. Um, so turning to Eileen, in your presentation, oh, sorry, Lynette, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow on what Ken Singh has mentioned. He talks about IAQ innovation. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to share with everybody that we have uh, recently launched an innovation challenge called Capital Land Sustainability X Challenge. X is an exponential. Uh, and in there, there are actually seven problem statements. And a few of them are related to what Ken Singh just mentioned. Uh, we recognize there's a need to reduce carbon emissions, but at the same time, there's thermal comfort that needs to be taken care of. So we want to challenge the, the sector to come up with solutions, you know, so that the opportunity is really to be able to scale up at our properties around the world in 220 cities. So I think uh, there is a need to really collaborate in the industry and the ecosystem to come up with new solutions, new ideas to solve the problem. So we can solve the lower carbon emissions, but then thermal comfort is an area which uh, we, we want to reduce, yeah, and air con, we want to open up uh, the windows, but then in a tropical climate like Singapore, it is, could be quite challenging. And uh, I think the students at the universities are able to bear that, they have no choice. But the tenants <laughs> in our properties, they are paying rent, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so we also need to take care of that. That's why um, I think all the heads need to be put together to come up with solutions. That's why the, we launched this innovation challenge. So for those of you who, who, who have not heard this, please go to our website. There are seven problem statements and IEQ is one of them as well. So we want to encourage the industry to really come together and we are actually crowdsourcing this globally. So, so there's an opportunity to partner with uh, different companies around the world uh, if your solutions uh, are, are interesting to us. All right, thank you. Yeah, maybe to add to Lynette, I, I don't know whether you all read the papers yesterday. There's also a, a fund by the Ministry of Sustainability yeah. and yeah. So, so there's a 50 million uh, SG Eco Fund that supports grounds up uh, uh, proposals. I think the call for proposal is out. Um, so, it, I, th I think if you have a good idea, good solution, I think that's where you can actually tap some support from uh, the government. 
Okay, so I want to get back to the capabilities uh, part. Um, so I was going to ask Eileen just now, because you mentioned in your presentation a number of very uh, high performance technology business solutions and all that, right? So uh, in the delivery of uh, Capo's Urban Solutions, have you faced any challenges due to lack of uh, enterprise capabilities or professional skills gap? You know, so at least our audience can get some sense on you know how we should be uh, preparing ourselves for the future. Yeah, thank you, Ivan, for the question. I think in Kabul, our business is slightly different because we are not just a developer, but we do a lot of infrastructure business. So in in Kabul, we work with consultants or internally with our own counterparts what we feel that is the most important is our mindset. Basically, you have to adopt a generalist and growth mindset because you cannot know everything, right? You cannot be an expert in everything. And moving forward, because we are trying to form a very strong ecosystem between infrastructure, urban development, and connectivity, we will need to know how the big uh, infrastructure utility systems work, whether we can close the loop in our urban development, as well as connectivity, whether we can use digital solutions to better enhance and uh, achieve, help achieve our sustainability targets. And that is not a very far-fetched goal. I think when we talk about smart cities, a lot of people would think it's very cliche or gimmicky or you don't really know what it means. But there are already a lot of proven uh, test cases and use cases that it works hand in hand. So like what Ken Singh said earlier, right? How we add more sensors to ensure that we know what is our air quality and how we adjust our mechanical ventilation system. So all these are already achievable at this point, but instead of just putting sensors, they also incorporate other data streams like user feedback, a simple app, a building app that people can say, oh, I'm feeling too hot, too cold. And simple usage uh, maintenance. You know, there are a lot of wasted energy in buildings that goes unobserved, like for instance, servers are still running when it's not processing data or you know when someone leaves a room but the lights are on and the aircon is still on. Simple things like that can um, be optimized a lot more if we have digital solutions. So I think moving forward, tech engineers need to understand digital solutions and how to use it. And the integration is the hardest piece that we are trying to work on now because every building system has their own kind of protocols, data standards, API and we just need to find a way. I know um, a lot of institutions are working on it as well, like the Brit Imam, which is trying to streamline all this data so that we can have more insights and more controls over our buildings. And I think very importantly, moving forward, we cannot just look at the buildings. We need to look beyond the building boundary, which is the district and the estate. Because a lot of times, if you look at single building, you will never get the economy of scale to do what you want to do, right? Like for instance, solar panel. If if it's HDB, they have the Solar Nova program, they can get it really at a really low cost and a lot of people would tender for it. But if it's a single condominium, I, I don't think there'll be much interest, right? Because the real space is too small. So moving forward, if you look at a district and even for private developers, private uh, uh, developments, right? Whether we can do block purchase, I mean, it's a wild idea, but whether we can do block purchase, whether we can streamline some of, some of this, to open up the, the boundaries and silos and so that we can work in a district level. I think that will help a lot. And one more point I wanted to respond to the, the point that architect Tang mentioned about private condominiums and, and I think Lynette mentioned as well. I think that's the, the hardest challenge that we are cracking because for residential, the willingness to pay is not there yet. That is why Architect Tang mentioned whether there will be green mortgages in future, which I think is already present in the UK. And it's very easy to uh, uh, justify or qualify, right? Because we already have a green building standards. So if you prove your platinum, they have a, a corresponding uh, mortgage rate. But that is like our dream and our hope for the future. But in the meantime, um, also reacting to what Ken Singh mentioned about naturally ventilation. Actually, it's my own personal pet peeve when I look at condo design versus HDB design, right? Um, we know that private apartments use almost double the energy of public housing. And that is because we are we, we need to squeeze all our efficiency, right? All our efficient floor area. We can't afford very generous corridor, very generous air, air cross ventilation. And we, we know that that is a constraint. So I'm not sure to... to really uh, solve the problem at a fundamental level, we may need to look at perhaps some relaxation of building codes to allow that to happen. 
because all these spaces, this opening up of gaps or for cross ventilation, it is not usable space, right? So why would you do that? But it's a very important step to achieve uh, our lowering of energy consumption. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pick up on your idea on, um, on, you know, maybe I'll invite the rest of the panel to share their uh, wild ideas on uh, how the public and private sector can uh, work together. So, and we're running out of time, so maybe I will invite a uh, Tai since you, uh, you know, you have positions on uh, the BCA board and SGBC board and you're also at, in private practice. Uh, perhaps you can share with us um, how can the public and private sector work together for the good of uh, the industry. And after mm -hmm. Koktai, maybe I can get uh, Kelvin um, mm -hmm. for you to share your insights on that. Thanks, Yuan. Well, <laughs> I think um, let, let, let's look at uh, green building. Uh, my, my experience is that uh, uh, it is uh, very challenging because unlike, let's say, when I'm doing a uh, productivity or universal design. It is very specific. When you're talking about green building and it's in relation to climate change, every one of us go out, uh, look up, uh, we are all under the same sky. So every one of us is, uh, have, a, have a stake and have a share. And that's also because of that, we, we have an opinion on how it should be, uh, it should be done, right? So, uh, and, and into that context, uh, because of climate change, uh, the Green building may, may put emphasis on uh, uh, energy, uh, but today uh, there may be a little bit more emphasis on uh, health and well-being because of COVID-19. Maybe down the road it may shift a little bit to uh, equality. We don't know, right? So in a way that when when my encounter with uh, with working in private and also dealing with the public is that uh, we need to have a very close uh, public and private collaboration. Uh, to to come up with a uh, with a policy or a strategy that um, that can drive the whole industry in one direction, but having said that, we must also allow for flexibility for other people who may have different interests in in the green building, right? So in, in a way that uh, the communication and the understanding have to be very very important. Um, well, some building uh, may be energy driven, some building may be, uh, let's say, well-being driven, and even some building may be um, uh, uh, other, uh, other uh, what you call it, uh, objective driven, isn't it? So in a way, the green building uh, uh, metric have to be uh, holistic, uh, but at this present moment, obviously, it's more energy driven because of the climate change. Yeah, so I, I, my personal experience is that uh, this green building is really a very, very challenging uh, roadmap. Our Singapore Green Building Master Plan, the, the latest one, where we actually uh, uh, engage the stakeholder, uh, the developers, the, the consultants, the ESD, even all the um, uh, contractor as well. Uh, everyone has different opinions and, and what they want on the green building, isn't it? So, so try to balance off everything and, and make it work uh, is really a, a big challenge. But the good outcome is that because everyone has the same interest, as I always mentioned, uh, SGBC has a big pool of talent because we, we have a uh, developer, we have uh, architects, we have engineers, we have a uh, uh, ES consultant, we have uh, builders, you know, Unlike other other agent, uh, other uh, council, you know, where it's only architects or engineer. Actually, we have a big pool of talent uh, with the same uh, objective and mindset together with uh, BCA. Uh, I think with with my understanding and my experience is that the close collaboration and understanding is very important to make our uh, green building master plan works. Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I pick up from what Kukai said. I agree with what Kukai said about the public-private uh, collaboration. I also want to uh, echo what Eileen said about, uh, about purchasing, of especially uh, things like solar. So this is something that we have recognized. Uh, for JDC, we have tried to squeeze out every single available space to put solar panels. But we realize that uh, that is just the beginning. We need to work with our lessees and tenants, our customers, to sometimes 
uh, as ID has said, it uh, may not be worthwhile or attractive for people to put solar panel on just a single rooftop. So we recognize that and that's why we have also started to call tenders and offer our tenders to our customers for them to uh, install solar on their rooftop using our terms that we bought purchased together. So we urge all our customers to come on board and uh, do this together. And then the other part of what Kota say is also very relevant about the, uh, we have to be realistic. We are in a tropical, tropical climate. We talk about natural ventilation. We talk about uh, green building design, but ultimately we are still uh, in a tropical area. We have to be realistic of what we can achieve. And our mm. problem is quite different from the uh, temperate countries where they have uh, four seasons. And I'm not saying those are easy to solve, but those have their own set of problems. And uh, a lot of the experience that they're uh, gain from those uh, design actually are not really applicable in the tropical climate and frankly uh, this is something that I think Singapore has an edge on and uh, it's something that we should work on to have an edge uh, to give our green sector uh, some advantage over the rest and I think because the new energy of growth is uh, in Asia and a lot of them in the tropical areas I, I think there's really quite a big market over here okay so uh, my last point I wanted to to, to say is that uh, uh, okay I, actually I want to take the opportunity to address one of the points in the Q&A about uh, sensors and uh, having control uh, that is something that we are quite interested on but that also takes a lot of uh, effort to gather uh, what kind of uh, we need to put in a lot of sensors but to make use of those things, we need data. Data to tell us and how to react to those uh, climatic uh, changes and respond. Uh, but a lot of time, uh, so we have some research project going on on that part. And why I, I think we are interested in that, and that's the last point that I want to make is that, uh, well, it's not easy to design green building in a tropical climate. Uh, it, it's still easier to do so for a brand new building design. but the bulk of our buildings are old. I think that's the part that we really need to focus on. And we think that those, uh, uh, how do we green the existing buildings is actually very important. And we think that those sensors and um, microclimatic controls uh, could be one of the solutions. And I just want to urge that we should not only focus on uh, new, new buildings, but also on uh, how do we retrofit the older buildings to be cleaner. So with that, I'd like to pass to the next speaker. Thanks. Mm. Uh, anyone else like to yeah, uh, Yvonne, yeah. perhaps yeah. I could just um, give some comments. Uh, there was a question asked, uh, it's actually asked uh, about financing and I, I, I believe uh, Marunisa would be in a much better position to answer that. But I just wanted to, since we're on the topic of private public sector uh, collaboration. I thought that's quite relevant because um, what we are finding is that for what MAS, uh, I, the government has been granting different types of schemes and which is fantastic, right? And BCA has uh, taken a very proactive approach in giving dif different kinds of grants. But when it comes to financing, and we are pretty experienced in this, we've, we've uh, gotten a few sustainable linked loans and, and bonds. Uh, it has been very helpful. Uh, but when we, it comes to uh, getting the grants from MAS, MAS only grants the, uh, give, gives away the grants for financing purposes. So, but in the real estate industry, as we all know, there's a lot of cost towards certification, towards uh, making our properties greener. So unfortunately, the MAS grant is not, applicable to this. So there, is, there seems to be a, a gap there. Uh, I guess maybe MAS thinks BCA should be the ones giving us a grant. <laughs> but the grant is, does not cover costs such as consultants fees, which are architects tanks fees, you know. <laughs> and then the other kinds of certification fees. Yeah, so there's this gap. We have nobody to go to for, for to fund such costs. And I think for to in, in order to spur the set the 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 area of finance, for example, especially for the SMEs, if they are here for the first time, they need to cover a lot of their costs and they may not 
be sure uh, how to do that and where to get the funding. So I think that gap uh, hopefully can be addressed among the government agencies. So I would say that, uh, uh, you know, I think for BCA, BCA has been, if BCA had not started with giving grants to spur the green greening of buildings, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I think there's a tremendously good effort. So we would encourage BCA to continue to do that. Uh, maybe to for BCA to also talk to MAS to try to close that gap. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lynette. Well taken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we are really uh, short of time. We've already passed uh, 10 minutes, but it looks like we have a very good group here to uh, work together to come up with uh, ideas for um, the authorities to uh, take to uh, MAS. Maybe, you know, with DBS also, we can uh, get, get some insights from the... the, the financial side right to strengthen our proposal uh, but i think i really have to uh, end the panel uh now so um thank you very much for your uh, active participation and very candid uh, sh sharing um it's been a delight and an honor for me to be moderating this session and uh, to our audience i hope that you have uh, enjoyed hearing from our panelists and our encouraged by the endeavors to work together to overcome the pandemic crisis. So I just want to paraphrase uh, Minister Chan Chun Singh's recent comments on the recovery for the mine sector. Uh, he said that, you know, we're not going to be playing defensive by just trying to get back to where we were. We need to go beyond and uh, achieve more. So if you would like to keep up with news and events on green building, I would like to uh, encourage our audience to reach out to the Singapore Green Building Council and you can find our contact details on SGBC's website. So thank you everyone for joining us today. I will hand the time back over to Christina, our MC. Thank you everyone. Thank you Yvonne. We would like to thank our panel members for the extremely passionate discussion. With this, it brings us to the end of the forum. And on behalf of BCA, RADAS, SGBC, and JTC, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers and panelists for being here with us today. To our webinar participants, we would like to thank you for joining us as well. And after exiting this webinar, you will be directed to access an evaluation form for today's session. Once you submit your evaluation, you will be able to download the speaker's presentation materials via the website as shown. Thank you and have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you, everyone.